Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. I'm Ricky Heller from RickyHeller.com, and I'm really excited tonight to have with me a guest, Jennifer Fugo. And Jennifer, you may know, she's she's been featured on my blog a couple of times already. Um, Jennifer is the founder of Gluten Free School, and she's also the founder of Club Gluten Free, and Club Gluten Free School, right, Jennifer? And um, the gluten free, the savvy gluten free shopper. So, which is a best selling book on Amazon and um, helps people who are gluten free to eat that way healthfully without breaking the bank. She's been featured on Dr. Oz and on CNN and many other outlets. So, I'm really, really excited tonight to have Jennifer with me. So, maybe you just want to say hi to everybody, Jennifer. Oh, thank you so much, Ricky. I really appreciate the introduction, and I'm excited that we get to chat. It's so great to be here with everybody. Yeah, I love these these live hangouts. I just think they're terrific. And so um, our topic tonight is the pitfalls of gluten-free, and Jennifer is going to be talking to us about those. So what the way we're going to work it is I'll, I've got some questions for Jennifer, and I will ask her about certain things to do with gluten-free, and we'll, we'll answer, the, or she'll answer those, and then... For those of you watching live, if you'd like to ask some questions of Jennifer or me, then we can do that at the end and we'll reserve some time for that at the end. And this is a topic that I know is really important to so many people because whether you're on an anti-candida diet or not, I mean, anti-candida happens to be gluten-free, but so many people are transitioning to gluten-free or have been told that they need to eat gluten-free and it's so important to do it in a way that's healthful. So I know Jennifer this is something you've been living um, every minute since 2008 and it's really your area of expertise so I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Well thank you for having me and I will say that I know this personally because I got gluten-free totally wrong when I went gluten free. I mean, that's the only way I can describe it because people, a lot of times, you know, will read books and your articles and you're very well schooled in things. But when you live it, when you make those mistakes, you really can speak about a concept or a topic or a lifestyle choice or a dietary choice from a place of knowing. And when I went gluten free, I thought that anything marked gluten free was healthy. I thought that gluten-free meant healthy, and that was a really big uh, point of confusion that cost me dearly because going gluten-free, I have food sensitivities to gluten, dairy, um, specifically casein, and then eggs, the cruciferous family, and some of that has changed, mind you, because I had those results, those tests done back in 2008, and some things I've, I've been able to incorporate back in to some degree. Um, not gluten. Gluten is a 100% that's for life. But I thought that because I felt better when I went gluten free initially, that, oh, well, of course, so gluten free must mean healthy. I got healthy. I got better. Yeah. And that wasn't the case. And almost literally, lit, Ricky, I kid you not, almost literally a year later, I had adrenal fatigue. I was 29 years old. I had adrenal fatigue and candida <laughs> from, yeah, from eating gluten-free products. And so, so maybe tell us a little bit more about like how that fits in into, into your story and the sort of changes you made and why that happened. One of the things I realized was that most practitioners out there were telling their patients or their clients to go gluten-free. And there wasn't a very good, I will say template at the time, uh, you know, paleo wasn't really a big thing. Veganism was, and I did try the whole gluten-free vegan thing. It was, it was just a little too hard for me and it didn't quite work um, for my body and that's fine. Everybody's different. Yeah. But um, I just, I really didn't have any advice to follow except for three websites. You know, here's here, go gluten free. This is what you need to know. Good luck. I'll see you in six to eight weeks. And one of the things that I realized was that there's a lack of clear direction about what is gluten free. And I kid you not, um, two days ago, I got an email from a woman, and I, I get emails every day from readers of my um, newsletter and of my website. And I love hearing from people. I love hearing their stories and connecting with them and learning where their, their issues are. And so many issues that people have, I've experienced personally 
Uh, and so this woman was explaining to me, she's like, I really, I know I need to go gluten free and I really need to do this, but I don't have time to cook and gluten's just everywhere. And it just seems so hard to like shop gluten free and then cook gluten free. And she's like, I just don't even know where to start, you know? And so my advice to her, and this is the, the, this is what every practitioner should tell a, a patient or a client. I don't know why doctors go think it's a death sentence to tell their patient that they have celiac disease or they have to, they're gluten sensitive. It's not, but there are, so, there's so much food out there that does not have gluten in it. Gluten is only in certain grains. That's it. Now, granted, I'm not going to, um, make it out like everything is gluten-free, you know, that it doesn't, isn't made with wheat flour or barley or rye or, you know, oats that are contaminated because oats need to be gluten-free, but real food that does not contain gluten is um, quite, there's a, a big selection at the grocery store. And when yeah. you learn I, what you oh, can I mean, eat, I think which problem, we can talk about. But, sure. Yeah. I, I was just gonna say, I think the problem is that the the standard North American diet is so replete with all those grains and wheat, as you know, is in so many processed or prepared foods that for the average person, when you say go gluten free and then they realize all these things they have to take out, it just seems insurmountable a lot yeah. of the time. Yeah. And the, and I can understand that. I was, Ita I'm Italian, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> everything that my family ate pretty much had <laughs> gluten in it. And I've come to realize now the traditional Italian cooking, there's not gluten in everything. Like, sure, the bechamel sauce for lasagna um, is made with wheat, and the pasta is made with wheat and the bread. However, many of their entree dishes and their side dishes, and even some pastas, uh, are gluten-free, naturally. And I think that was one of the biggest ahas. That's what I was saying about my, the woman that had written me, is that when you have that aha moment, that there is so much food out there that naturally is gluten-free, that you can gravitate toward, that's one of the most freeing moments in the entire process. Because all of a sudden, the grocery store goes from like this big, where you're like, oh, I have this like half aisle that I can shop in, to a really great selection of very healthful foods that depending on your personal you know, philosophies or your, what your body needs and what you're going through, you can absolutely piece together a diet no matter where you live that is naturally gluten-free and healthy at the same time. Yeah, I think it's absolutely very, very similar for people who are told they need to go on an anti-candida diet for the first time. And, you know, like when I work in my coaching with clients who are, they're just overwhelmed by, you know, I have to cut out this and this and this and this, what am I going to do? And I'm sure that was the same for you when you first went gluten free. So I'm really curious to hear how you ended up after that first year. Like, what was it that landed you in that position where you found yourself with candida, where you found yourself with other issues? Well, I'm not going to lie. I ate a lot of cookies, a lot of brownies, a lot of pasta. Um, I didn't like the bread. So gluten-free bread and I parted ways long ago. I, on rare occasion, will get gluten-free bread, but it's not often. I just don't like it. And, and was that just because suddenly the, these were the things that you thought were your gluten-free options, right? Sure. I mean, I cooked, yeah. well... That's the thing too. Like it's funny. I teach cooking classes now, and I have one coming up in a week that I'm teaching. And I did not learn how to cook until I really went gluten free. I mean, I had to. Otherwise, I wouldn't. My, I mean, my mom. I wasn't living at home, so I can't expect my mother to just like make me food and bring it to my apartment. <laughs> I had to learn how to be an adult and take care of myself. So that was when I really started to play with food and learn what was out there and get in the grocery store and have some fun with it. But I. I didn't like initially what I was eating. And so for me to be able to have the cookies or the pasta or anything like that, it helped me feel normal. And, you know, again, I come from an Italian background. So I was used to having pasta three times a week. I was used to having sandwiches for lunch almost every day. Um, you know, there are things that I, yes, I miss, but I don't think about them often anymore. 
And I realize now that in the moment when you eat junky food, whether it's normal food or gluten-free food, when you eat that junky food and it has a very bad quality to it, it's processed, it's refined, it's greasy, um, any number of things that make it unhealthful, you don't feel well. And so in shifting gears, I feel so much better now. I, you know, there's no desire to want to go back to that. Um, and that's why I have to be really careful about what I eat, what I drink, you know, because you have to be careful with sugars and how many sugars you add into your diet. It's really easy. Like smoothies are wonderful things, but uh, it's very easy for people to load smoothies up with excess calories that come from sugar and even fat. I mean, I know like you're, you and I are both friendly with Leanne um, and Leanne Vogel and she's wonderful and she'll probably be the first person to tell you. And I know that another uh, woman that does, is really into the ketogenic diet told me on my podcast, you have to be careful adding fat, liquid fat to beverages because you can end up consuming so many calories as a result of that it's a little dangerous yeah so finding your right fit of what's going to be good for you um, I think that was the key and finding joy in simple foods you know like I, I I love raspberries I took a picture of them today and I put it up on Instagram because I love raspberries I love strawberries I have found joy in just having like one food on its own. And I'm not saying that people are going to go from having um, like potato chips to this and saying, oh, you know, that's a natural transition. It took time. But I think when you start to really get into the qualities of your food, buying things, if you can, more organic or, or prioritizing what should be organic and what shouldn't, what you can afford to spend more money on and what you can't, and with time, you slowly can afford to buy better quality food, especially that's one reason why I wrote my book. But um, yeah, you have to find a diet that's going to work for you you know, and, and base it around, like for your audience, like the anti-candida diet is going to be a big thing. I always think like figure out what the building blocks are and start from there to build your own unique diet that'll work for you best. Yeah. Like I think there are, there are many similarities I know in the way we eat because you're also sugar free and you have the sugar free, uh, gluten free, sugar free cleanse that you offer as well. And, and so I think, um, it's really important, like when you were talking about the smoothies, to watch out for sugars. And I, relating that to sort of the gluten-free products that most people find, especially when they initially go gluten-free, do you think there's something perhaps misleading a little bit in the way the products are presented? Because so many of them really do contain excess sugar, I think. Am I right? They do. Yeah. Um, one reason is because gluten-free products are missing the bulk that gluten typically provides. There's that binding agent that protein is missing. And so one way they can, um, and listen, I'm not a baker. You probably know better than, than me, Ricky, about this, but you have to have, you can't just like remove one ingredient and half the quantity of it and assume that if you, everything else stays the same, it will come out correctly. Am I right on that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you know, I love to tell the story. I think I just told the story in one of, one of my previous videos about, you know, I've been baking since I was six. And when I first went gluten free, I made one of my favorite recipes. And all I did was I replaced the wheat flour with rice flour, which, you know, weighs about four <laughs> times. A minute. So I literally had a, it looked like a, and felt like a brick, but it was a brick that just fell apart into like sand because there was no gluten to hold it together. Right. It was horrible. So yeah, you exactly. absolutely. Exactly. It was horrible. Yeah. And that's and one of the biggest issues. Yeah. yeah. And so they add the sugar to make up the bulk. And then on top of it, the other thing too, and I tell people this, it really doesn't matter whether you're buying, what type of gluten-free flours you're buying. That's where you have to be careful. The only, the exceptions are nut flours and coconut flour. Those are different than gluten-free flours. So thinking like um, bean or legume flours or just the other grains, um, they contain a lot of starches. And that's where the problem really comes in. And I hear this all the time is someone will say to me, well, I got brown rice pasta. Isn't that better than the white rice pasta? No. No, it's really kind of the same thing. I mean, it's they're both very refined. There's probably 
a little more fiber in there, but at this point, it's a refined food product. So stop patting yourself on the back for getting quinoa pasta or brown rice pasta. And in reality, it's all, all of those carbohydrates are getting converted to sugar. And so you know, you, you say, talk a lot about that, Ricky, and what yeah, the, the sugar that, will do. I was just gonna say, I do still, I will have pasta occasionally, and I'm wondering for someone who's just making that transition, um, you know, so do you never eat pasta, or would you say once in a while is okay in your opinion? I absolutely eat pasta once in a while. Like maybe once a month I'll make pasta, and, you know, it'll last my husband and I maybe two or three days. That's about it. Um, I, I don't find that it's one of the centerpieces of the, the dishes that I make. I love crock, crock pot cooking, so I'll do like a whole chicken in the crock pot or some other type of um, stew or chili and make a lot of it. I have a lot of um, bone stocks in my my freezer that I use throughout the, the year, and um, I try to cook fresh and, ke again, keep things simple. So that for me is more important than pasta. I, I honestly find pasta because if we make pasta, I can just eat a lot of it and just keep eating and eating. And I don't like that feeling. So I'm very cautious. I, in the summer times, we'll make like zoodles with the um, zucchini, the spiralizer. I have one of those. I got it last year. Those are great. And I'd like to try some other vegetables as well. I also have kelp noodles yep. um they are made from kelp they it sort of looks like a jelly like jellyfish tentacles yep. and i found out from experience that if you cook them or not cook them per se but if you let them sit in a tomato based pasta sauce for like 10 minutes and it's hot they they mm, they don't soften but they're not as like crunchy and they're a little more palatable my husband who's not into like healthy food was like oh I can eat these no problem I made yeah. the mistake of trying to add pesto to kelp noodles <laughs> that was not good I would not advise anyone to do that I actually had to throw them away which stinks because the bags that I bought were like seven bucks a piece so I felt I was just like oh I'm wasting food but I could <laughs> not I could not eat it it was just not good so I think and that those are things one. to keep in mind oh what's that are you familiar with konjac? It's uh, sometimes they're called shirataki noodles. I think they uh, so there, there are some made from tofu and there's some made from this new. It's a, a root flour called konjac, K-O-N-J-A-C, and um, I, they're very similar to shirataki noodles. So again, you have to really rinse them and cook the sauce, so cook them in the sauce. But they're very, very low cal and very, very high fiber. So they're a great alternative too. I think. Yeah, and I've tried some things like that, and some have, some, I actually tried one the other night, and the, it had a rather chemically flavor. I know they don't all taste like that, and I had to toss it. I'm, I, mm -hmm. Anything that tastes very chemically and really uber processed to me is just, I don't, I just personally don't like. But I think that there are options out there. There's, you can just steam vegetables and put pasta sauce over top of it and add some nutritional yeast. Um, I think that's okay. Nutritional yeast is okay on an anti-candida diet. Uh, not, in, not in the early stages. When you're first starting out, it's really better to stay away from it because your body recognizes it as yeast. But yeah, later on, you can absolutely. I, I will have it occasionally now, too. Yeah. So, I mean, there's plenty of things that you can do. And, and if worse comes to worse, another thing that I used to do, I don't eat quinoa on its own as much anymore, but quinoa itself, if you cook quinoa and add some vegetables to it and then add sauce on top, that's also a really great thing. And I do use quinoa in soups as like pastina because my mother used to make pastina, which is like a little tiny little pearl um, pasta noodle when I was a kid. And so quinoa takes the place of that now because there is no gluten-free uh, pastina. So there's plenty of things that you can do. I just think you want to be mindful of how many starches that you eat and make sure that you're not also replacing protein because protein isn't really important, especially if you have adrenal fatigue or you have energy issues. Taking out too much protein and just replacing it with a lot of carbs is not a good idea. 
Um, so you just want to be careful of that as well. So be mind, and that's something that I've had to really work on is be mindful of like how much protein have I had at this meal? And I actually went online and calculated how much protein I should have in a day and started being more aware of that. And that's really helped um, me manage, even though I've come back from adrenal fatigue and I wouldn't say, at least I don't know that I have adrenal fatigue again, although I slightly suspected it with all the school and the crazy schedules and I am <laughs> looking to get myself retested. But um, one thing I have had to be aware of is just how much protein I consume on a daily basis. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I did want to go ahead. I think, most, I think most people in North America in particular think we need more protein than we do. Because according to the World Health Organization, it's only 0.8 grams per, is it per kilogram? I'm trying to remember the formula. But most of us need like maybe 50 grams of protein for the average person, and yet we eat so much more than that. So, mm -hmm. you, yeah, I think you're right. You can go overboard and um, process. So, you know, people need to watch the, the starches. Yeah, the absolutely. Is there anything else? Like we talked about protein, we talked about starches, legumes. Anything else you would, you would think people need to really watch out for it? I would say too, and I also want to address, I see one of the questions that one of the the women, I think Maria, Maria had mentioned down below, um, okay. is that you really want to be careful of fruit. I love fruit, and I think fruit's a great thing, but there is sugar in fruit, and I recognize that on some level our body can process the sugar from fruit better than it can from sugar that's added to, you know, baked goods and such. But one of the things that, and this is, I, I did a grocery store tour with a client last week and we walk into the grocery store and the question I always ask my clients when I do these tours with them is, okay, you walk into the grocery store, where do you head first? It's like the best question for me to understand where the problems are, but also to simultaneously get them to realize that what they're doing is not correct. So it, it's a teaching mechanism. And she goes, oh, well, I head over there to the cut fruit department and I get a lot of fruit. The problem is that people will buy these beautiful containers like this big of fruit and say, oh, well, that's for lunch. I'm going to have all this fruit for lunch. <laughs> you can't eat fruit for lunch. That's not a healthy meal. That's, that is sugar, um, especially more tropical fruits. Tropical yeah. fruits are a lot higher in sugar, and I know that, um, you know. Anyone sure on an anti-candida diet knows that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and they're very high in sugar. And so for me, my preference is to guide people more toward like berries, like strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, blackberries. Um, you know, if they, if you can do apples, like I like Granny Smith apples, those are my preference because I find that they're just not quite as sweet. So they don't yeah. tend to trigger this desire to have more sugar yeah. and um, pears. Um, and also gravitating towards sweeter vegetables like r red bell peppers, things like that, carrots, things that have some sugar in them naturally. Um, yeah. That way you're getting that flavor in without feeling deprived because I think a lot of times when you take all sugar out, um, a lot of times it's very hard to maintain that diet, especially when you're not getting that flavor because having – all of the flavors that we are accustomed to in our diet is important to maintain regardless of what diet you change to. And so if you take all of the sweet out, well, yeah. um, that ice cream is going to look really good, like m probably more tempting than it normally would if you were a bit, quite a bit more satisfied with everything else that you were eating. And so, you know, um, I feel, oh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So, no, I, was just gonna go say, ahead. I feel like, sorry, that, you know, when when I um, I do this course called You're Not the Boss of Me with Andrea Nakayam, and it's about balancing blood sugar. And one of the things we talk about is not feeling deprived even when you remove sugars. And so, I mean, if, you were, if you've been on the anti-candida diet, you know how my approach is. You can still have sweet things. They just have to be sweetened with zero glycemic or low glycemic sweeteners. So I totally agree. Like, I will only eat those kinds of fruits as a rule. Once in a while, I might have something else. But certainly if somebody's just starting, they've got to have only the low glycemic. Yeah. And I think that's one of the big things is like they figure, well, there's no gluten in fruit. There's no yeah. gluten in a white potato. You know, there. well, that's true. But a white potato gets turned to sugar in your body. Yeah. So these are, again, some of the things of like learning what the safe, safer starches are, the, the healthier, lower glycemic starches are that you can have that are naturally gluten-free. Um, you know, and I think too, being mindful 
I will also say this, be really mindful of how many grains you're eating because there's that tendency as well to like pile a huge heaping of rice on the plate and then there's, you know, your your protein and then a little bit of veggie. You don't, you can't, again, we can't just be carb centric because if when you have, you're in a state of dysbiosis where there is more bad bacteria and yeast and there are the good bacteria, that has a very detrimental effect on the body as a whole. Whether you experience candida type issues and, uh, and you know all about that, Ricky, or whether it's showing up as neurological issues, gastrointestinal issues, any number of things, skin issues, whatever, yeah. your gut is not just your second brain, but it helps regulate your immune system. So many things are just connected to that that little home and we need good bacteria in our guts in our small intestine you Absolutely. have to have them there um, and what you feed them so again if you're feeding them these highly refined gluten-free starches with loaded with sugar and I would actually want to tell everybody if you're not aware of the whole teaspoon measurement thing and then this was very eye-opening for me is that every about every four grams of sugar on a package is one teaspoon because grams don't mean anything to me I'm like a gram I don't even know what that looks like exactly so knowing that that was one teaspoon and then I look at Oh my goodness, I go to like um, these grocery stores and I'll pick up the juices now because like the pressed <laughs> juice is all the rage here in the States. Yeah, I hear um, too. And some of the less expensive ones, they've got like 24 grams of sugar in a bottle and it's yeah. two and a half servings, a little tiny bottle, two and a half servings. And I was like, that's more than 50 grams of sugar in that whole bottle and I could easily drink that in one sitting yes and have no, I go oh it's healthy um, so I think it answers the question about this whole issue of people tend to think that gluten-free foods are healthier and I don't know if it's intentionally that the mar a lot of the marketing is done to mislead people and I don't want to go down that route necessarily to assume like oh yeah all food companies they're out for our money they don't care about our health I don't really know. I don't know what their intentions are. I do know that they want to make money. Every company needs to make sure that its bottom line is taken care of. Some companies are more um, socially and environmentally conscious than others. Some care about the health of their clients. Some yeah. might not. I don't know. But at the end of the day, you have to become your own food detective. You have to become your own food advocate and your own health advocate and really question any claims, health claims that you see on that packaging. And even if it looks like this really healthy product, flip it over, look at the amount of sugar in it, look at the ingredients in it, and make a decision based off of whether it's really going to be the best choice for you or maybe it's worth spending a couple of extra dollars getting a better quality product with less sugar that maybe is organic, who knows? Because, you know, it's nice to have less, fewer pesticides and things. Um, sure. And that has less refined flours, less processed sweeteners in it, less artificial colors and things. Just think about that. What does your body really deserve? And it deserves to be treated in a way that amplifies health. Not that in the moment satisfies this need to feel content by eating something that gives you know your you a a, a nice little um ping to the brain of you know sending sending all those dopamine sensors uh ringing to the to the heavens with like oh. <laughs> and that you know it feels good because food can also be a distraction from the emotions that we feel it can be the oh, a distraction yeah. from the stress that we have in our life and it's no different and gluten-free this is the thing that kills me is that gluten-free is oftentimes more unhealthy than the gluten-filled versions of the same exact foods because yeah. of the refined flours, because of the added sugars, because of yeah. all the nasty oils that they add to a lot of these products. So for your own, for your own health and really only you can be your own advocate for that. Um, try, try to start making, little choices that add up to something a lot bigger and better for you in the long haul. 
Absolutely. I think that's that's a great place for us to pause. And I think the upshot of what you're saying too is, I mean, real whole foods are naturally gluten free. So you don't have to go to those things. And that's it's a great way to start eating more of those whole foods, fruits, vegetables, if you eat meat, chicken, whatever. Um, I cannot believe it, it's already nine o'clock, Jennifer. But you know what? If you're game, maybe we'll take a few more minutes and answer any questions that we sure. have um, on the page. So I'm just going to flip to the page here quickly. I think there's there's um, one comment. I definitely, I yeah, I see there's one, um, I guess, a comment or a suggestion about the whole issue with going to Starbucks and giving yes. up the coffee, um, giving up Starbucks and other coffee places. I don't know. Well, this is live, live broadcast, isn't it? I'm gonna go into <laughs> Not a problem. I can hold down the fort. So not being able to necessarily give up coffee um, or or having to give it up because you don't know whether it's gluten free. That's a cross contamination issue. Um, there is an issue in the U.S. that a lot of our food supply is contaminated with gluten, and I will say that it is important to look for the gluten-free label. Not just certified gluten-free. I think certified gluten-free is especially important if you know for sure or you're fairly certain you have celiac disease. If you're not certain or you don't, you feel like, okay, I have gluten sensitivity or I'm kind of sensitive, knowing that a product has a gluten-free label means that it should test under 20 parts per million of gluten. Yeah. We hope the company is doing their due diligence. Now, is that something that works for you? Because I know um, other, another blogger friend of mine who's gluten-free, she says that even if it's 20 parts per million, she still reacts to it. Or, or do you think 20 parts per million, like for you personally, is that something that's an okay um, sort of line of distinction between what is and isn't gluten-free? So that's a really hard question to answer. And I actually have yeah. some grievance with people that say that. Um, it's not to say that you can't be sensitive. I, there are definitely some issues with some of the research that's been done, and there have been people that have questioned, and I, I, be I believe if I'm not correct, it was Dr. Fizzano's research that, w w that based that that number is based off of. Okay. That's, that's basically, it comes from his research. Okay. The problem that I have with all of this, and this kind of goes to the cross-contamination issue, um, is that you can be sensitive to more things than gluten. I mean, I li listed out a bunch of things in the beginning, and many times people will f fixate on gluten. Like if you have celiac disease, they'll fixate on gluten. Well, there is a possibility that your body could see other proteins that look similar to gluten and think it's gluten and react as if you had been glutened. You could also consume proteins that you have no Sorry, idea. I'm you for a second there. Oh, so what would some, what would some of those other protein like what would some of those foods be that you might react to? So they're called cross reactive like, foods and yeah. there's So some, would oats be in that category for instance? Well, that's a yes, but oats also have another protein in them. Um, that some celiacs do react to. So there's different issues with different proteins, but like they'll say that sometimes rice can be cross-reactive. Um, that I'm trying to think, the list is pretty long. Um, there's wow. a bunch of things on it, but if you look up cross react, gluten cross-reactivity foods, um, it'll come up. And okay. This, this, oh, this is like a rabbit hole. This is a really deep rabbit hole. Um, I don't know how deep I want to go because it could take a while to explain. But basically, Cyrex Labs is the one that produced this, um, this list, and they do testing around it. It's not to say that because you're gluten sensitive that you are then going to cross-react to other proteins in other foods. It's not to say that. I have seen some of their test panels, and someone could cross, maybe cross-react to two of those on two of those other proteins on the whole list. So it doesn't mean like, oh my gosh, gluten, I, now I have to take out all of these other things. That's not what it means. However, a lot of times because gluten can create a leaky gut, meaning that there um, is there are spaces in between the cells that line the gut where proteins sneak into the body where they should not be, you can then develop other food sensitivities. Yeah. I had a client that was sensitive to asparagus of all things, but she ate a lot of asparagus. She would eat it two or three times a week, but yeah. she became sensitive to asparagus. She was sensitive to cucumbers. These are all very healthy things, by the way. 
but right. she was sensitive to them. You can develop sensitivities to any other types of food, and you can't assume that it's just gluten. So right. when people oftentimes tell me, well, I react if it's 20 parts per million. First of all, a lot of times you don't know. A lot of companies, even if they get their products tested so that they are certified gluten-free, oftentimes they even fall below the threshold that that certification requires. And still, that company will get calls saying, I've been gluten by your product. Even though the company tested the entire batch, has results certifying it, well, let me ask you, have you looked up those other ingredients to see if you are reactive to them? that are in that product. So I'm not saying, I am not saying to anyone out there that the product couldn't be contaminated, but I think it's important to keep in mind that this whole issue of what threshold do we react to and how sensitive are we, it does beg the question of how well you know um, the scope of your sensitivities because yeah. you can have similar reactions to other food proteins that you would think would be gluten, but it's not. So that that's my whole thing. And, and again, to kind of go back, yeah, corn is one of them. Thank you, Maria. Yes, corn is definitely one that are on that list. Um, but to, to, to speak to Maria's um, point about coffee, you know, I find Starbucks and some of these other chains to be a little questionable. Um, they used to have a brand of teas that I knew were okay, and they've since switched their brand of teas, and I don't feel comfortable with them anymore. So I think you have to really go with your gut and ask questions. Um, you know, if you don't feel like you can get an answer from a barista or someone working behind the counter, speak with a manager. And if you still can't get a straight answer, then don't go there. But I carry tea. I think it's always better to be safe than sorry, right? I mean, Absolutely. If, you're, if, if you're in any way uncertain, I feel it's always better not to eat it. I was just going to say the um, the whole issue of leaky gut and multiple food sensitivities is so, so common with people who have candida. So it just behooves the person to go and get tested if you can. Or even, you know, you can do it for free by doing an elimination diet if you don't have the funds to get the testing done. It, it, it takes a little longer, but it's, you can just do it through diet. And I think that's really crucial because you're right. You Otherwise, you don't really know what it is that you're reacting to, right? Mm-hmm. And it can change. I mean, you can be, you know, if you're depending on the level of leakiness throughout the gut, you could be reacting. And this is this is a red flag for anyone that keeps finding that they're reacting to more and more foods. Most likely, at least from all the experts that I've talked to and interviewed, at that point, that's a red flag for leaky gut syndrome. Yeah. Because the gut is just so leaky. It's like basically taking the shower curtain off the outside of your shower and the water's just going everywhere. That's yeah. essentially what's happening. Um, you want food particles to stay unless they are broken down to the appropriate parts that get absorbed appropriately yeah. um, based on what they are. They should stay within the digestive tract. Yes. And when they start sneaking out in ways that they shouldn't be is when you start to have problems. So when you work on resealing the gut, you should see the number of food sensitivities decrease. So it is possible if you have like 10 food sensitivities and you work on your gut with time and when it's appropriate, that number should start to shrink. Yeah. Um, if it's not and you're doing it on your own, then I would suggest there's nothing wrong with seeing a practitioner. I mean, there are some times when we are, we have blinders on to what's really going on and we don't see all of the pieces or we read somebody's blog and you're like, oh my gosh, that's me. And you start thinking that everything someone else is doing, that protocol or this way is, is what you should do. So there is a time and a place for getting help and coaching or seeing a practitioner. Um, there are, like you said, you can do an elimination diet on your own. That's perfectly reasonable as well. But if you find that your issues are not getting better, it is time to bite the bullet and say, you know, I need some outside help. I need someone else who's not, who doesn't have any pre-existing notions or pre preconceived notions of what may or may not be going on with me um, and, and get their opinion on it. Yeah. Great. Well, listen, this has just been so, so informative. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to, or I, I don't, um, I think that's it for, for the live questions, but is there anything else you wanted to just add before we sign off for tonight? I would say that no matter where you on your journey, 
you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. It's some, this is, this phrase is something that I think about often. Yeah. I did not get to where I am now. I mean, even like this glass of water, I hated water when I was in college. <laughs> I hated it. I couldn't, I drank soda. And then I had to step myself down to club soda with a piece of lime. Actually, I think I was doing juice first, club soda and juice, and then slowly got myself off of soda to water. So just that alone, and I know that sounds very simplistic, but no matter where you are, you don't necessarily need to be where I am or where Ricky is tomorrow. You're on your own journey and you shouldn't feel bad because maybe you are still eating refined gluten-free products because maybe in this moment you just need to make the transition to being gluten-free and that's more important. I like to give people a month or two, figure it out. That's actually a really great time to get help, by the way. Not like three, five, seven years in when you still aren't being compliant being gluten-free because you didn't learn how to do it right the first time, get help early on. It makes life much easier. You will avoid a lot of pitfalls. And ultimately, you will you fast track yourself to a healthier, happier life because that person will guide you through the process of telling you exactly what to do. And then you just learn how to do it. It becomes like riding a bike. So Rome wasn't built in a day. Take baby steps. Keep on moving despite sometimes what feel like setbacks can be the biggest blessing of your life to show you what else needs to be resolved. Um, And, you know, I wish you all the best of luck. And um, if you are new to gluten-free, I also have a really great handout on my website. If you go to glutenfreeschool.com, we have a kitchen clean-out guide. It's actually one of the images. It'll be on the left-hand side, and you can just click on there and put your email in, and I'll send you this really great guide of everything that needs to get out of your kitchen that could potentially be glutening you, because a lot of times people will think it's just food, but there are some unfortunate ways because we need to change, swap out some things in the kitchen when we go gluten-free, depending on, especially if you bake. That's a yeah. big problem. Um, but learning you know, where you got to swap things out, you can have my entire list of what I give to clients um, for free. So, yeah. Fabulous. That sounds great. And I think that's such I, – I don't think it's some, too simple at all. I think it's very, very important because people – really kind of they they hope or they expect to get better so quickly and you and I both know this is a journey and like I've been doing this since 1999 on and off and it's taken me till now to even get where I am I just have to show this we have the same glass and we're both drinking I know we do thank you you so much Jennifer this has really been been informative so everybody go to Jennifer's site it's glutenfreeschool.com and you can get that handout. And what I'll do is I will put the links as well under the video for everybody, all the different things that we've talked about. If there's anything specific that you need a link to, you can find Jennifer at her site. Um, you're also on Facebook, right? Do you want to just quickly run through your links on social media? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on Facebook at Gluten Free School, three words, no hyphen. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. I. Uh, uh, at and G- those are G free school, right? G free school. I have a YouTube channel. <laughs> oh my gosh, with the social media, there's so many spots. I and know, I do it's crazy. different things on all of them, and I do answer people. I, you know, if you have a question directly, the best way to get in touch with me is to send a tweet. That's usually like the fastest way. I answer personally answer everything, so I love connecting with people and answering questions. But my website is a really great resource, and then I also have a podcast. If you're interested, and either you listen on your Android or you have an iPad or some sort of Mac platform. I do have a really great podcast, which Ricky has been on. And um, yeah, so I get to interview experts and authors and doctors and nutritionists and such all about different aspects of living a healthy gluten-free life. And it'd be great to, uh, to share that with you. And every, again, it's all a lot of really great free resources out there for, for my community. Yeah. And that's through um, Jennifer's site as well. So All right. Well, thank you so much again. It's been fabulous to talk to you again. Always enjoy it. And I'm sure it's really great. It's all the information too. Well, thanks for having me, Ricky. And I wish everybody the best of luck and hopefully we can do this again soon. All right. Great. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching.